this is a great weekend. It's the ladies seminar tomorrow. That's our best seminar of the year. Yeah. It's a killer. Anybody know anything about women? <laughs> On the face of it, it appears I don't, but I do. Women have a sensitivity to the Holy Ghost men don't have, generally speaking, not specifically. And they just go with it. And tomorrow's going to be a blowout. It's going to be big. Okay, didn't get any amens on that, so <laughs> let me, uh, Kelly, can you switch it over to my Mormon teaching? Uh, <laughs> what is happening here? Welcome to the Arizona Deliverance Center. This is Phoenix. And tonight, this altar is going to be hot. It's going to be big, big. Big, I got a bunch of anointed helpers here left and right, and it's gonna go great. I got a good teaching for you tonight. You gotta have this teaching for 2024. You're gonna kill it. And I'll prove it to you in just a second. <clears throat> All right. Welcome to our YouTubers. I love you. Uh our, our building was destroyed a few weeks ago. We had a major plumbing break, break underneath the building, and the whole half the building was jackhammered. It was awful. It's the worst thing I've ever been involved in. But <clears throat> we had a bunch of people step up, and I want to thank you for that. The donations were fantastic. And, you know, there's about, what is it, two thirds done now or something like that? I mean, we're getting close to the end back to normal. So thank you for your patience. I'm sorry about the bathrooms, but they're working now. The bathrooms are working, so you don't need to go <laughs> down the street to the healing house to take a leak. Okay, you go right in here. See, that's the luxury of American living. You go right over here to go. So we're so grateful that I'm getting putting this thing behind me. Really tired of it. So I'm sick of it. Yeah. Brother Mike, sick of something? Yeah, I get sick of a lot of things. <clears throat> All right, let's start with the teaching then. The Invisible World. Part three of the seminar. You'll really enjoy it. There's all of our teachings on YouTube. Just go to youtube.com slash houseofhealingaz and you can get 400 teachings. If you got five or ten minutes, you can look for them. <laughs> but, uh, my radio programs are all archived. You just go to the website, hardcorechristianity.com. And then you hit the home page and the media page, and then you go right to the radio programs. Click, click, click. You're there. If you'd like to help us out financially, you switch over from Google to Good Search, put in our charity name, and they'll pay us while you surf the web. Uh, this is my most important thing. The, the miracle list uh, is an amazing thing. It took me years to develop it through prayer and trial and error. Please order one of these. I send out a couple dozen of them a week. You just go step by step. It works 100% of the time. And usually I can get about 10% of the people to do it. So that's my problem. Uh, there's the uh, teaching if you're interested in the deliverance ministry, and I recommend you pray about that. This is uh, not a fun, fun ministry, but there's 18 classes there that you need to go through, and it will save you from making all kinds of mistakes. You can buy them in the bookstore, but not now. The bookstore is closed. There it is. If you want to know what's going on today, the seven churches of Revelation are in the bookstore, and the bookstore is closed. Our Zoom Wednesday night is a killer. I hope you'll join. Send me an email, mike at hardcorechristianity.com. I'll send you the code and the password. And you can down, download it, our app on your phone if you would like to donate. Thank you for that. Uh, the Carters are here. There he is. Hi, Mike. We got a prayer meeting. We pray for the ministry. Michael's doing that. Teresa. 
Okay, fourth Saturday of the month at 11 o'clock at the, in the Healing House. Not in here, but at the Healing House, okay? Please come and pray for us. The reason I started that up was because we're starting to get some exceptionally sick people coming here for deliverance. We're getting a lot more sick people coming for deliverance, a lot more mentally ill coming. And we need the anointing to go The anointing will not go up if nobody prays. That's not rocket science. This is NASA. This causes the anointing to go up. This isn't rocket science. Hello? Come on. <clears throat> Brother Mike, how do you know all these things? I, I read the Bible. I have a deliverance training class, fourth Saturday of every month at noon, usually in the small sanctuary, but that's wiped out, so we'll be in here. Noon on, oops, yeah, 27. Donation boxes are on the doors. Thanks for your help. You can download by PayPal off the website if you want to. I've been on the radio for over 20 years. There's the programs on 1010 AM Christian Radio. I'm on every morning at 7.30, Monday through Friday, and then I'm on Saturday afternoons and Sunday afternoons if you'd like to listen to them. I'm also on conservative talk radio now on Sundays at 8 o'clock in the morning, 1100 AM. And at 9 o'clock, I have a podcast and I bring some odd Bible studies. At 9 o'clock in the morning, 9 o'clock Arizona time, twitch.tv, HCCADC, just put that in and you're there, we're there, we're together. It's a family situation. YouTubers, now remember, start your ambush team in your church. These work really good in a mega church, but you, they work in a small church too. It only takes two or three of you and you start picking off the sick people in your church. Pick them off. You know, like cans on a fence. <laughs> and they'll get healed and delivered, and then the word will spread. You'll have a rack of people chasing you down the halls. Somebody will go to the pastor's office and tell them what you're doing, and then you will be kicked out of the church. <laughs> That's a sign from God that your ministry is to go to another level. Kickouts are re rejoicing periods. Somebody tells you, shove that up your fanny, drop dead, you suck, start jumping around for joy. Because God's moving you from here over to here. And it's going on a tr this trajectory. It's, you're down here now. Screw you, get out. Oop, there you go. Up you go. Thank you, Jesus, for allowing people to screw me. That's how you pray. Brother Mike, how do you learn these things? Don't forget about the ladies. Tomorrow, obviously, big Zoom meeting, Zoom meeting Mondays. You know, all these things are great. Tuesdays, in person, usually in the small sanctuary. That's destroyed right now, so they'll be in here. 6.30 p.m. I wrote these books. They're all kind of interesting, but they're not available. They're bookstores close. To <laughs> skip over that. <clears throat> Tonight's being broadcast here and there, and I think on Facebook, I didn't check, but she said she was going to put it on my Facebook page. Rumble. We're doing real well on Rumble now. Okay? So just put in our HOHHCC, and there we are. And then it will be rebroadcast on these platforms later. Did I mention the women's seminar? Okay, there it is, tomorrow. <laughs> All right. 2023 kind of sucked for you, but we're going to fix that whole thing tonight. 2024 is going to boom. And I'm going to show you exactly what needs to be done to accomplish that. You'll be amazed. I hope. As my wife says, I hope. All right. Let's start it out... Uh, I'm going to try and be inclusive tonight. Honest Abe Lincoln. You know what he said? People are just as happy as they make up their minds to be. Yeah? 
Albert Einstein, I like that guy. I, re I read a bunch of his stuff. I thought I'd share a couple quotes with you. And uh, he said, when you sit with a nice girl for two hours, you think it's only a minute. When you sit with a, on a hot stove, a minute seems like two hours. Why? In the middle of every difficulty lies an opportunity. Why is that? <clears throat> There's the Holy Spirit. No, no. <clears throat> Your perspective on life determines how you die and how you live, right? I was a secular counselor for 25 years. I never uh, did use this test because I was not certified in it. You have to have special certification to, to do this kind of test. But as you know, uh, here's a famous uh, picture from the Rorschach test. What is this test? It's a personality test. And uh, the clinician gives you each card, right? And here are the, all the cards. So I just pulled one out, the famous bat, bat card. But anyway, when you look at the card, you look at it and you interpret it based on your personality, your background, your perspective, how your mind works, and so on. So uh, each patient has their own interpretation of this thing. So what do you see, uh, ma'am? Yeah, you. Well, what is that? What'd you say? Butterfly. Sir, how about you? You look like an interesting person. What is that thing? What is it? Moth. A moth. I got a butterfly and I got a moth. Okay. Uh, I'm afraid to ask you. So I'll go over to here. Ooh. Wow. <laughs> Gone. Uh, what is that, ma'am? You look intelligent. What is that thing? Moth man. Oh. I would move if I were you. <laughs> Weird. Spooked out. You, get, you see what I'm doing? You see what they're doing? So the idea simply is your perspective on life determines, can be determined through this test if the person administers it right. It takes a lot of years of experience to do it right. But, for example, if, I, if somebody looks at this and, and they see something perverted or violent, and then you see a consistent pattern. How about this one? How about that one? And you see a pattern of revelation within that person that's telling you something about their conscious mind and their subconscious mind. So what looks like the Mothman to her is could be uh, a neighborhood. Looks like a guy that raped kids in the neighborhood. Well, where did you come up with that? Well, it's coming out of your subconscious, and this psychiatrist is trying to figure out what kind of a person you are and what kind of tendencies you have psychologically, if that makes sense. Okay? So God doesn't use the Rorschach. I don't use it either. But I just thought it was interesting because it's similar to our Bible study tonight. Your perspective determines where you end up in life. Two people can look at exactly the same thing and come up with a completely different interpretation, like the Rorschach test. Could be a butterfly, could be a moth. Okay? Your perspective on your life determines what happens to your life. Not what happens to you, not the bad things, not your adversity. It's your perspective on it that determines what happens to you in life and how you die how you serve God. That's why the Bible is so emphatic on phroneo. Let this method of focus, let the stuff you focus on, okay? So in athletics, couldn't be easier to interpret. You got all these other players, for example. Then you got Kobe Bryant, okay? these All these players are physically as talented as Kobe Bryant. They're all the same. Some of them are more talented. 
But Kobe Bryant was better than all these other players. Why? He had this freakish capacity to focus on the job at hand without being distracted. Hello? Let this mind, the, how you focus, be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who had the greatest skill at this of anyone who ever lived, by far. By f and he could do it better than anybody. For as much then, 1 Peter 4, as Christ suffered for, for us in the flesh, arm yourselves with the same mind. Okay, now this is different. And only as a Greek word, it means pattern of thinking. See, when I was living in sin, I always went to a happy hour at Aunt Shalata's in North Phoenix. I think it was North 7th, Street, 7th Avenue, 7th Street. Huh? 16th Street. North 16th Street. North 16th Street. How do you know that, sir? <laughs> Uh, can we get can we get somebody over here? German, German. Can you get this guy out of here? Uh, he's scaring the ladies. I go up there every every Friday night. My business associates, the other counselors, some lawyers, whatever. We're all hanging out. And some of the guys that would come up there were perverts. You know, and and how do you know they're perverts? Well, everybody, every everything you want to know about a person, you just have to sit with the ability to listen. Because when they run their mouths, start talking, they reveal, like a Rorschach test, what kind of a person they are. So some guys were just, had terrible lust demons, worse than, the kind, worse than I had. And they would always say some, something lustful. Make a comment about a girl, breasts, booty, everything. And every time they say something, right? So that is a pattern of thinking some people are pattern of thinking, anger. Some people have critical spirits, negative. Some people are chronically negative. And they have a pattern of thinking. Arm yourself with the same pattern of thinking, Peter said. And in Romans 15, it says, Now the God of patience and consolation grant you to be a like-minded, be like-minded, same Greek word, Paul said, all you people learn to focus on the same thing. Focus on this, see? Creating unity among the body according as Christ taught you to focus, right? Hebrews 1, he leaves glory and becomes a human being. Can you imagine the, the letdown on that one? Unbelievable. I wonder what Jesus was thinking. I sometimes wonder when he got about, I don't know, seven or eight, he looks down at himself and oh my God, I'm a human being. Okay. Now that's a come down from glory to this yuck. I can't wait to get rid of this crappy body. It doesn't work right. It stinks. <laughs> right? It's got weird pains in it. Odd gas. Weird stuff. <laughs> this body needs to go to the trash. I'm ready for the rapture. I don't know about you. I want to get out of here. I want to get a new body and get this piece of certified garbage buried. No offense. He wants everybody to focus the same. So what he's saying. So that you may be one mind. What? Now this is a different word. Okay? These, Greek, these English words don't really, you know, give you the broad picture of it. Okay? Homothumadon means everybody th is unanimously thinking the same way. See? You're thinking evangelism, you're you're thinking man, you're thinking you're thinking you're thinking healing, you're thinking healing, your group's thinking everybody's thinking the same thing in a similar thinking pattern. That's what he's saying. Okay. 
And when you think the same way, you speak the same thing. See? Yeah. So in your ministry, you don't want somebody going this way or somebody going that way. You want everybody on board. Is what he's saying essentially. I'm just I'm just putting it in different terms. <clears throat> and if you're on board mentally, you will everybody will be speaking the same thing, right? Years ago, it was back in the 90s, I think it was ninety-six, was it? I went to Pensacola. And uh, they had a Sunday service at the Revival. Sundays was a regular service, Sunday service. But Saturday night was prayer night. So all these hundreds of people would show up at the church there in Brownsville, and they would all be praying for Revival. It was exciting. I never heard anything like that before. And then all these people focused on getting these people saved, healed. You know, there was some kundalini floating around in it. But everybody Saturday nights was at the prayer meeting. I went to the prayer meeting Saturday night. It was spectacular. Never seen anything like it. But everybody was speaking out the same thing they were all thinking. They were all focused on the same thing. Holy Spirit, move out and get these people and bring them in. Right? I, I saw it. It was it was fabulous. <clears throat> Second, First Corinthians chapter two. Who has known the mind of the Lord? Now that's the Greek word nous, and that's the general description for your mind. Your mind is inside your brain. Okay, the total mind here. Who has known the total mind of the Lord? Who instructs him? It's a rhetorical question. Of course, no one. No one. No one knows that. The total mind of the Lord. But he says, we have the total mind of Christ. Who's he talking about there? Paul and whoever was in his group. Okay. He wasn't talking about us. Okay. We're working on that. I'm working on it. I'm not there yet. Well, thanks for that downer, sir. Can somebody get this guy? We're all working on it, okay? But Paul, well, he was almost right there. I mean, if he, if he wasn't, he was close, right? But he's telling them, this is your goal in life. See? That's your goal. I want to think. I want my mind to work like Christ's mind works. That's my goal in life. I haven't reached it yet, and I probably never will, as he said. He threw a monkey wrench in this thing, but... That's our goal. Okay. And then it says, your perspective on life determines everything about you. Everything. Good, bad, adverse, failures, losses, victories, success, doesn't matter. Your perspective on life determines everything. Even if you're in the ministry, let's take two people here, currently in the ministry, powerful women of God, seminars tomorrow for the women, I thought I would throw this one in, for the gals, here it is, these two gals were hardcore servants of Christ, both of them. Luke 10, it came to pass that Jesus entered a certain village in Bethany, and a certain woman named Martha received him into her house. He frequently went there, and Martha was a powerful believer Frequently served God. She was a hardcore servant of the Lord and was always taking care of him. She took care of the disciples. Fantastic. She had a great ministry. Mary had the same ministry. They both ministered to Christ and the, the apostles. They did fantastic. And then Mary was there, and she was sitting at Jesus' feet hearing the word. And so Martha and Mary are both in the ministry, but you can take one Christian here and... It, take this Christian, and they can hear the exact same sermon and be in the exact same building around the exact same people, but come up with a different perspective. Can't they? 
Yeah, Martha is there hearing the word. Mary's there hearing the word, but Martha is focused, Franeo, focused on her ministry of serving. She's a servant, and so she's staying with that. She's focused on it, doing a good job. And Ma But Mary is also in that ministry, but she, Mary's got a different perspective on ministry. Mary wants to go to this level here in ministry, and Martha's at this level. Mary's at this level. Martha wants to stay at this level, doing a good job. Mary doesn't. She wants a Holy Ghost ministry. <laughs> Whoa. How do you get a Holy Ghost ministry? Well, you can't get a Holy Ghost ministry acting like a regular church person. I know what you're thinking right now. This isn't a Baptist service. No, it isn't. <laughs> if you're in the ministry, that's great. And you're doing a good job. But if you want this ministry, you've got to do some things differently. Mary left her ministry here and went over to sit to hear the word and not miss one syllable of it. Martha was listening to it, but she was doing other things, distracted, busy with her ministry and doing a good job, not criticizing her. I'm showing you the difference between this minister and that one. 99% of ministries are here. This is a Holy Ghost ministry. Okay. You got to be able to get into the Holy of Holies to get that ministry. You don't to get these ministries. Martha was cumbered, paraspao. She was being pulled in different directions. I got the plates, I got the bowls, I got the guac, uh, the prep, the food, whatever they ate back then. Uh, this guy was ordering out at McDonald's, whatever it was, they're busy doing that. She's busy with that, yeah. She's busy with, but Mary, no, no, she saw an opportunity. Listen to me carefully. Regular church Christians who are in ministry don't recognize certain opportunities when they're presented because they're too busy doing their own ministry. Did he just say that? You can be so busy during your own ministry, you end up a screw-up. I know what you're thinking. Is he a Jehovah Witness? No. No, listen. Listen. If you're in this ministry, the Holy Spirit will give you opportunities to go up different directions or higher or something. But people that are too busy don't see it. She's too busy. I'm, I got to do this. I got to do that. Serving God, I got to do this. Then I got to do that. I got. Martha is doing a good job, I'm not criticizing her. She's, she's too busy. Too busy with ministry. What did he say? I said it. She comes to Jesus, he says, Lord, don't you care? See, regular Christians, when they pray something, they don't get an answer to prayer right away. The devil always comes in and says, hey, you know, I don't think God cares that much about your prayers, and maybe he's not listening. And so the, the Christian starts to get a little fussy with God because this wasn't answered. This didn't happen. I expected it to go here. It went, it went there. This didn't happen. And the devil gets the Christian to go, I think the problem's with you. You see that? Martha, does anybody listen? Martha's in ministry. She's doing a great job. She's a wonderful woman of God. I'm not criticizing her. I'm, I'm telling you. You could be so 
busy serving God that you missed the open door to go into the holy of holy. And if she's praying, Lord, I know you're going to tell her to come help me. I know you're going to, and he didn't. And her prayer wasn't answered like a modern day Christian. And so she got fussy with God. And she tries to manipulate him. Oh, you have any idea how many manipulation prayers go unanswered? Oh, you can't even believe it. Lord, if you do this, I'll do, if, if, I'll, 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 ooh, yikes. So she starts to twist his arm. Don't you care? That stopped it. See? Now Mary's the only one going into the Holy of Holies. Martha got left behind. Ladies, this is your pre-seminar. I hope you're listening. And then she tries to shame God into answering her prayer. Don't you care? I'm having to do this alone. Now, Jesus never said she had to do the whole thing alone. He, he never said that she's, Mary's not going to help again. He said, Martha, you are, Maram Nao, you have anxiety about so many things. You are Tarasso, you are emotionally agitated. That's a soul experience. Your soul starts to get, oh no, oh no, usually based on fear. Martha, you're doing a great job and I love you. Thank you for all you're doing, but you're so anxious about things. Anxiety. Why is that so dangerous? Why is anxiety so dangerous? It quenches the spirit and blocks your answer to prayer. You're jacked up about so many things. Huh? Many people that are in ministry are nervous wrecks. Why? Nobody will help them. Their partners are idiots. The church doesn't support them. There's a bunch of morons in the group. <laughs> it happens all the time. All the time. What did I just describe to you? Almost every ministry. And not here, of course. <laughs> One thing's needful. Kriya! Okay. Okay. Martha, sweetie, you're doing a great job. You got everything covered. But you missed something. There was one thing missing. You missed Mary. Mary doesn't want to stay just a servant. She wants to go up here. She wants a Holy Ghost ministry. And she saw what was missing. Mary did. And I, she's not going to be missing out on that part. She caught it. See that? See that? Martha's a good woman of God. There's nothing wrong with her. Ouch. She missed opening. But Mary wanted to go here. So you can't act like Martha if you want to go here. John 12, they come back again for another supper, and guess what? It happens again. Martha's running the whole thing. She's doing a great job. This was after Lazarus was resurrected, so she had another plate at the table. He's sitting there ready to eat. 
Martha's got it going again. Again, good ministry, good woman, faithful. But Mary said, hey, I see another opening here Martha doesn't see. Because I don't want to stay with here anymore. I don't want to have a nice ministry anymore. I want God's very best. See, pe Christians who want God's very best don't act like church people. They're completely different people. Their perspective is different. They think differently. They focus differently. Mary was focused on higher ground. She was looking for Zion. Martha was good here. She good. I hope I'm talking to somebody tonight. She gets out her best. The Muran Nardis, the special perfume, the oil from India, very costly. It was one year's wage for most people. And she anoints the feet of Jesus. The third time he's been anointed, what were the other two times? Simon the leper, Simon the Pharisee, and the third one and last one before he's killed. Isn't it funny how God uses numbers? I'm not big on them, but three is an interesting number, isn't it? Okay, three anointings. Three crosses. <laughs> Sir, I did not ask you to give all the threes. Can, can somebody... Oh, we got security here. We're lucky to have bathrooms. Here it is. The whole house now is experienced and Mary's step up. See, once you, once you start making that step up, the Holy Ghost spreads and everybody knows what you're doing. You can't hide it. Wow, somebody broke out the best stuff, the stuff from India that cost a fortune. <laughs> she brought it out for the Savior of the world. The best stuff for the best person. Why? She wanted to go from here to here. Who wants to do that? Not too many people. And if you don't want to do it, I'm not here to condemn you, but there's some people here tonight who are listening to this who want to get out of this level and go to that one. You hear that? John 12. Judas pitches a fit when he sees this. Judas is motivated by greed. Poor guy, he grew up poor, and he saw other people having things he didn't have. Money, material things, the Joneses next door always were better than them. And so he had this deep-seated urge in his soul to be successful financially. And he starts reaming, reaming hey, well, this is ridiculous. That's, that's that India oil. That thing's worth a fortune. We got to sell this thing. We, got, we, we need, we need uh, donations to fund your ministry, Jesus. He, he had the whole thing worked out. He Bill Gates the thing. See that? And Jesus defended Mary. Didn't defend Martha. Martha's busy. She's running. She's on her. She's doing a good job. She's got her ministry going. Mary doesn't want to stay at that level. She doesn't want to spend years doing that when she could have been there. Let's switch over. Two people, faithful believers, Mary and Martha, look at something exactly the same, same person, same circumstance, same day, same spot, and come up with two different perspectives. Right? Zacharias and Maria, Mary, do the same thing. Didn't they? Sure they did. Uh, before I get into that, I want to teach you just a little bit about fear. The, devil, the devil's favorite weapon against born-again Christians is fear, and he uses it like a whip or a club. And he knows if he can get you to have anxiety, Martha, and then develop fear, 
he can stop your anointing and destroy your ministry. Fear is a cork in the new wine bottle. Nothing's coming out. Fear causes you to say and do things you would never normally do. He beats you over the head with it. He's vicious. He did everything he could to get Jesus to fall into fear. He strapped him to the whipping post. He beat him half to death. Failure never happened. That's a picture back in a time when America was doing really bad things. That's what they call the whipping post. Yeah. That's exactly what demons do to Christians. They whip you with fear. It starts out with a little anxiety. It starts out with some negative thoughts, and then it builds. And once the fear hits the soul, whew, the anointing drops. The answers of prayer that left, like Daniel, stop. Halfway there, they got caught by the prince of Persia. Because I got afraid. Why does that work that way? What's wrong? How, God, how do you figure that out? Easy. Fear breeds doubt and unbelief. People who fear lose their faith. They sink like Peter. You sink like Peter. Fear wipes out your anointing. Quench not the spirit of the Lord. Do not grieve the Holy Spirit, Paul said. How do you do that? I'm scared. It's his most effective weapon against Christian. Fear. Fear of public speaking. Fear of being rejected. Fear of no one listening. Fear of nobody caring. Fear of there's a billion of them. Luke chapter 1, here it goes. There appeared to Zechariah an angel of the Lord standing on the right side of the altar. Utterly amazing story. Zechariah is an old man. He's shot. His wife's an old woman. She's shot. She's got a uterus, but it looks like a prune. He's envious of a stiff wind. He's shot. And they've been praying for years, decades, and God had not answered their prayer. And the devil beat them because when the prayer doesn't get answered, he always comes by and says, he's not going to show up. Want me to prove it to you? Another month goes by, another year. The prayer is not answered. Zacharias had sunk into unbelief. Superpowered Christians are patient. They know their prayer was heard. They know the answers on the radio. They read the story of Daniel. They know how this thing works. Somebody's temporarily blocking the prayer. They stay faithful. They press in. I used to be in the semi of God religion, and this one church I went to, some old woman used to go down to the altar. she start praying. Then she start crying. Everybody looked at her and go, whoa, what's that all about? If you needed a miracle, everybody went to her. Hey, Grandma, I, you know, I'm going in for surgery. Do you mind? She'd head down the altar. Hello? You didn't read Praying Hyde's book? You didn't see that? Yeah, Hyde went. Hyde goes to the, to the church to pray, and the pastor goes, can I go with you? He says, sure you can. Hyde goes down to the altar, gets on his knees. The pastor sits in the chair watching him. Hyde doesn't say one word for 30 minutes. Total silence. Then, 30 minutes later, he lets out a sigh. 
A few minutes later, the pastor's sitting there and he feels someone walk past him down to the altar. Hair stood up on his back. Hair. When you invited Hyde to your church, you had an instant revival. People were falling out of the pews, into the dust, crawling down to the altar with tears. Families climbing over pews to get down to repent. Hello? Anybody listening? Whoa. Zacharias was down at the altar. Powerful man of God, strong believer, faithful servant, right? The, 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 uh, the priest ran in cycles. This guy would take this period, then that one would take that period, and this one would take that period. They called it running your course. He's down there running his course, and guess what? An angel shows up after all these years. My God, I've been praying for decades for a son, decades I'm shot now, my wife's shot, I'm tired now, but I'm still a believer and I'm still doing my Martha ministry. I'm still doing my Martha ministry. I do the incense. Temple. Yeah, doing a good job too. Good man of God. He looks up and guess what? The devil leaps into the scene, jumps on him. Poof! With what? His normal weapon on Christians. He uses fear. He looks up at this angel and can't believe it. And he's scared. The angel said to him, what? Just what everything, every time God talks to you, he's always telling you, fear not. After Jesus rose from the dead, the first thing he said, fear not. And the second thing he said was, fear not. He was walking to him on a boat on the water, fear not. Why? Fear is Satan's whip for Christian. He whips them into submission. And when they start to have doubt and unbelief, they can't stop him. And he wins. <laughs> Fear not, Zacharias. Look at this. Your prayer is heard. Your wife shall bring you a son. You'll call his name Giannis. John. No, too late. Too late. Zacharias wasn't praying hide. He had lost something. His carnal nature took over. He took a look at his body. Holy crap. He took a look at his wife's body. Oh my God. If you ever seen two naked 70 or 80 year old people. It's frightening. <laughs> How do you know all that, Mike? Well, I'll tell you so you don't think I'm a pervert. I'm, I'm four years old, five years old. I'm in kindergarten. And uh, it's a Saturday morning. It's Saturday morning and uh, cartoon morning, right? And uh, I'm older than most of you, so the TV tray's there, and the black and white TV is sitting on the TV tray. The, the antennas are broke off. There's hangers stuck in it. Saturday morning is cartoons. Thank you. We got some spiritually deep people over here. So I'm getting up at 5 o'clock, but what do I got to do? I got to go take a leak. I'm five years old. I open the door. Unbeknownst to me, I'm excited about the cartoons. I can't wait to see them. I open the door, not thinking that my grandmother, I just finished up a shower. I looked up. I had a Red Sea look on my face. I had never seen a body. Look at that wrinkled. Naked old people. Avoid them. That's a community service announcement. Yeah, I like to do that sometimes. You know, community service now, stay away from naked old people. <laughs> Not a pretty sight. He, Zacharias lost it. He didn't say focused. 
See, he lost his focus. Praying Hyde went to the doctor and said, Hey, listen, your heart's jacked up bad. You need you need six months of total rest. Okay, we're gonna put you we're gonna put you in a care center so your heart can go down. Hyde left the doctor's office, went to the church, started praying again. Died of a heart attack. A couple years later. Why? Hyde was a Mary. He wanted to go here. He didn't want to be down here. Everybody else down here. Hyde wanted to go there. He said, what do you? He starts asking him questions. Well, listen, some questions are unbelief questions, and other questions are questions of information. Those are two totally different things. Zacharias's questions were unbelief questions. What are you talking about? What do you mean? I'm look. I'm shot. My wife's shot. Look. What are you talking about? How, how's this going to happen? What was he saying there? What you're saying is is stupidity. The facts obviously contradict everything you just said. He wasn't asking him questions for information. He was he was stating negative questions. Oh, come on. Really? Now, that's a question, really. But really, what is that? Qu that's not a question. It's me stating I doubt that. Correct? That's what Zechariah is doing here. And the angel says, hey, I just came from the Holy of Holies. And God sent me here directly to you to bring you these uangelizo. What is that? The gospel. The gospel is glorious good news. I just came here to bring you the gospel of Jesus Christ. Your, your wife's going to have a son. You're going to have a son. You're going to call his name John. That's what you name him after you have him. But, Siopao, because you didn't believe me, you're not going to talk till he's born. Why? Some people are in the ministry and they're doing a great job and they're at this level and that's where they want to stay. Mary didn't want to stay there. Some people pastor churches, everything's okay, enough money coming in, got this group going, that group going, it's all good. But some people don't want to stay there. There. Until that day, these things shall be performed because you did not believe my words. Wow. What causes that? Fear causes you to develop doubt in your soul. He was scared when he saw the angel there, petrified. And doubt crept in. Well, doubt had already been there because he had prayed last week. Lord, I'm praying this prayer again, but I don't really believe it anymore. A lot of Christians pray prayers they don't believe. That's very common. Shortly thereafter, almost the same incident. Same angel. Similar circumstances. A miraculous birth. Two Christians can see the same thing with the same person, hear the same thing, watch the same thing, and come to two totally different conclusions. Based on their perspective. The angel comes to Mother Mary, Greek word Maria, and he says to her, You are highly favored. The Lord is with you. Bless you. Gabriel again, same angel, same visitation, supernatural. Everything's basically the same. When she saw the angel, she was troubled. Dia Terraso means she was super agitated. Zacharias is agitated. She's really agitated. Yeah? What's the deal? I don't know. My guess is she was like 14 years old or something, and he was an old man. So she got more stunned, more shocked that a 14-year-old girl who came from a family of nothings and nobodies would have an angel come see her when she had nothing and was nothing. 
That's my guess. I, it doesn't say that. I can't prove it. She says she's listening to his logos, his words, and cast in her mind what sort of salutation this is. Dia logizomai means she was thoroughly rehearsing what was happening in her mind. Logizomai means to contemplate something, to collate something. It's where we get our English word logical. She was highly focused on what was going on. Deep thought. Far more agitated than Zacharias. And she was thinking in her mind, what's going on here? I'm a 15-year-old kid. What, what is happening here? Anybody would have had this reaction, I think. Nothing wrong with it at all. The angel said, Mary, the same thing. See, the devil whips you with fear, and God is always saying to you, fear not. I got this covered. I got your back. You have found favor with God. What was he doing there? Trying to get her fear level to clunk. Right? I do that when I'm counseling people with anxiety disorders. I pull out my Bible. Have you ever read that verse? I'm trying to get the anxiety level drop. Behold, you're going to conceive in your womb a son. You're going to call his name Yahshua, Yeshua, Jesus, whatever you want to call him. He will be great, and he will be called the son of the highest. The Lord God shall give unto him the throne of his father David. He will reign over the house of Jacob forever, and of his kingdom there shall be no end. Incredible section of text. Summarizing that, you're on the right team. Then he said to Mary, as Mary said, Maria, how shall this be seeing I know not a man? Now she's 14, 15 year old kid, but she has enough knowledge to understand where babies come from, and she knows that Intercourse is the only way to have kids. Now we can have them petri dishes and, and stuff like that. I'm talking about back then. The only way to have a child is through normal human intercourse. So since she was a sexual virgin, she's contemplating this and asking a question, not Zacharias mocking, but a question of information. How is this going to work? This thing's closed up. I don't get it. I'm, I'm a kid. Good questions. All good questions. I would have had them myself. The Holy Ghost shall come upon you. Pow. The power of the highest shall overshadow you. <laughs> and that holy thing born of you shall be called the Son of God. So he answers her question. She receives it and believes it. Then he says, hey, I got another one for you. Sun Ganes, a relative of yours, Elizabeth, the same things happened to her. There. And she was, she's an old woman, right? You're, you're young. You know, Mary was fresh as a daisy, right? Her relative was shot. Guess what? This is a miracle? That's a miracle. Two people can see the exact same thing, hear the same sermon, be in the same room talking to the same person, and come up, come up with two totally different perspectives. With God, nothing is impossible. What a statement. And Mary said, unlike Zacharias, I am Dule. I am God's slave. Whatever you said, I'm good. Zacharias sitting home. Hey, Zach, come on now, spit it out, buddy. I can't spit it out because fear caused me to doubt and have unbelief. Man, Maria saw it differently. She said, okay, I understand. I am Jehovah's slave. Dule. Come on, ladies. I should have had ladies on that. Tomorrow is your day to come here, a regular person, and leave here a slave. Come on, ladies. I'm talking to you. I must have made him mad. Sorry about that. Be it unto me according to your rhema. 
Okay? Here's how it works. Logos is the whole subject. Rhema is a portion of it. Logos is the pie. Rhema is a piece of the pie. Okay? She only got a piece of the Word of God and believed it. She didn't get all the information about how this was going to happen, what was going to happen to him, what's going to happen. No, she got a little bit of information. She bagged her fear, which allowed her to believe. People who fear can't believe. That's why the devil used it. He wins. She took a rhema word for God and bought it. I believe. I'm just enjoying my own Bible study right now. I don't care about you. <clears throat> Let's switch over to another one. This group of people can see something the same as that group in the same place at the same time and come back with two totally different perspectives. Correct? <clears throat> the Lord spoke to Moses. He says, listen, send the men into the land of Canaan land that I'm going to give to the children of Israel. Okay? And every tribe of their fathers, how many were there? Um, send a man who's a ruler among them. So Moses said, uh, go to each tribe, pick out the most respected guy, not, 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 not somebody who's got bipolar, somebody that's a leader, somebody's on the money, somebody who's respected, okay? Take them, take them 12 guys, send them into Canaan land. Moses sent them out to spy the land. He gave them instructions. He said, go southward. Go up into the mountain, see the land, see what it is, see the people there, check out whether they're strong or weak, just a few of them, or if there are many of them, give me a report. O and R, go observe and report. See? That's what security guards do. <clears throat> when I moved out here in 1980, before many of you were born, I... Couldn't find a job. I don't know if you remember that, but there was a big recession back then, and I'd gotten out of graduate school. And, I mean, I, I applied. Well, I keep track. I kept track of it actually. I kept a, a notebook of it, and I had applied for over 200 jobs, and didn't get any of them. I had a wife at home, one of several, but that was the first one. But um, ain't nobody's perfect. But anyway, I had a wife at home. In a bad mood, and I had a three-year-old, and the other one was nursing. And I can't find a job. Okay? Anybody know what pressure is? Okay? It's not just in balls. Phew. So I got to do something. So I took a job as a temporary, part excuse me, part-time security guard at the Arizona Coliseum over here. And uh, I had to wear a security outfit. Now, I made that outfit look good. Yeah. <laughs> but we all wore the same brown outfit. Uh, I think they were related to UPS, but I'm not sure. But anyway, I used to wear, everybody wore the same outfit. But I didn't have a gun. And I didn't have any authority, okay? We, we couldn't do anything. I couldn't make any arrests. I couldn't stop anything. We were on O&R, observe and report, okay? So I got stuck working, you know, concerts, rock concerts, okay? I remember one night working a Blue, Blue Oyster Cult concert. I, I don't even know if they're still alive. Probably not. They all probably OD'd, but anyway... I was working the out, outer level on the second level of the Colosseum that day, and uh, the pot smell coming out of the auditorium was so thick, I was starting to get high. And I'd never smoked pot before. And I started standing there and I started spacing out. I was in my O&R stance. 
Pretty impressive, right? Did that heap feeler in your soul? A lot of fear there, wasn't it? See that? I was an authority figure wearing my brown security outfit. Some guy on pot, drug, drugs or something come up to me. Hey, you security guard? Yes, I am. I didn't know that. Grabs my sunglasses out of my pocket and runs down. Okay. The whole night went like that. Something weird was happening all night. We were dragging people that had passed out in the bathrooms. We were pulling them out of there, taking them down to first aid, whole nine yards. It was nuts. Blue Oyster Cult. That was a rock group back there. You probably never heard of them. But anyway, um, we've got some heathen here. <laughs> See, I was like one of the rulers of Israel. My job was only to O and R. I was not to do anything else. I was to go into the land, file a report on it. Here's who's living there. This is what's going on. And then I was to go back to the supervisor, the manager, the CEO of the nation of Israel, which was Moses, the man of God. And I was, I was to share, we were to share what we saw, what was going on, and so on. Pretty easy job. Right? <laughs> well, actually, no. Tell me what the land is. Who dwells in there? Good or bad? All this stuff. Are they intense? Are they in stronghold? Give me a, give me a report. O and R. Like Brother Mike at the Coliseum. Don't arrest anybody. Just give, you know, give us a report. And then it says, bring back fruit. Because it was grape season. Okay. What was Moses, God doing there? Uh, he was trying to encourage the 12 tribes. Look, look at this. Look at this report. Look at all this fruit. Look at the crops. Look at the agriculture. Be encouraged. Let's go. 40 days later, another, money, another funny 40 days, another number thing. Yeah, I don't, I don't like getting involved in that, but it's kind of interesting. These different numbers pop up. 40 days, they came back. Flood 40 days. Jesus fast 40, stuff like that. What does that mean? I, I'm not, I don't know. I don't, I don't teach on that. But anyway, Moses said, they brought him back word. They showed him the fruit. Everybody's encouraged. Wow. We came to the land you sent us to, and it flows with milk and honey. Oh, more good news. They were looking at what they saw, brought it back. Hey, everything's going great. This thing's fantastic. The people are strong that dwell in the land. The cities are walled and very great. We saw the children of Anak there. Those were the uh, Nephilim, right? Now you can see what's going on here. It's not what you say. It's the tone you say it in. You can tell what somebody's really thinking by the tone of their voice. Okay, anybody married knows what I'm talking about. You know, there's a tone of, you know, can you take out the trash? And then there's a tone, can you take the trash out? Oh, I get up immediately and head for the trash on the second admonition because I heard the tone. She's not here tonight, so I'm, I'm off scot-free. She's not here. She's not here. I'm good. See, the tone of this, the tone is being included in the information. You follow this a little? And it says the Amalekites dwell in the land of the south, the Hittites and Jezbedites, the Amorites. They're in the north. They're in the mountain area. The Canaanites are down by the sea. Here's where they are. Okay, that's good information. No problem there. And guess what happened? Caleb pops up and says, this couldn't be any better. Let's go get it. All, t all 12 of them are in the ministry, but two of them wanted to be like Mary and Mary. The other 10 were at this level and stay there. It's funny, they all saw the same thing at the same time, but 
10 uh, had a different perspective than the other two. Yeah. See that? And the devil took out his whip. What is his whip? Oh, fear. Nephilim. Whack. You're dead. Fear caused them to use that tone. They're stronger than we are. Okay, now that could have been a statement of fact, or it could have been a Zechariah statement with a certain tone in it. The angel Gabriel caught the tone. Mary didn't have that tone. Do you follow me? Yeah. You don't have to be a counselor like me. I've been doing it for 40 years. You don't have to be a counselor to figure out the tone in people's voices. Everybody follows that clearly. And again, particularly if you're married. We are not able to now. The ten spies went above and beyond what they were asked to do. They were only supposed to be like Brother Mike at the Colosseum, just observe and report. They start giving their opinion to Moses, the man of God. They didn't, he didn't ask them for their opinion. He didn't want their opinion. He simply wanted the information. And their opinion and the tone of their voice was fear-based. When you have fear, your thoughts are negative, your emotions are negative, and your behavior is negative. Simple, satanic psychology. He's a master psychiatrist, the greatest. They start saying negative things, and they're not saying it in a private meeting. They're so scared, they're saying it in public. Satan whips people in public because he wants fear to spread. And it did. The ten spies started to run their mouths like a busted chainsaw. Nothing but negativity came out, and the other people around them were listening. They started to fill their depends. Fear transferred into the people. You can transfer faith into someone. You can transfer fear into someone. It's easy to do. We can't go up there. They're too strong for us. They brought an evil report back. The land eats up the inhabitants. Translation, they're going to eat us up. See that? They all saw the same thing. All 12 spies saw the Nephilim. Right? They all saw the people. They saw the strongholds. They saw how they lived. They saw the weaponry. All 12 did. But two of the 12 had a different perspective. They had a 2024 perspective. Yeah, two of them did. The other 10 had a 2023 perspective. Another year of failure and losses. All the people we saw, they're huge. See, the, the devil uses the fear whip because he's able to get you to blow things out of proportion. Fear causes you to see things as a delusion. Anxiety and fear cause you to see things worse than it actually is. We saw the giants, they said. The Nephilim, we saw them there. We were in our own sight. Fear is Satan's greatest weapon against Christians because it makes them see themselves as nothing. Vulnerable. Weak. A failure. See, they got a rhema word, but they didn't receive it. They rejected it. Why? Fear wipes out God's word. 
What? That's blasphemy. It is? Did you ever read the parable of the sower? There was only four grounds. Three of the grounds ended up in the dumpster. Why? Perspective. I got to be helping somebody. If you're not listening to me, I'll just go secular on you. Okay. Elon Musk. This guy's brain's a freak. He doesn't see things like other humans see it. See that? Okay. If you're not going to listen to God's word, let's go with some secular guy. In his mind, he sees this is fixable, and it's not just that. It's this. And I can take it from there to here. He naturally sees it. Our sight, because we have fear, I'm a nothing in our own sight. See that? Moses didn't tell them they were nothing. They didn't get a memo. They got it out of their... They became failures in their own mind. We're like grasshoppers of them. You just step on a grasshopper, you just shush it and it goes. That's what we are. Fear causes you to see all your inadequacies, all your failures, all your losses. They suddenly spring to life. And he just whips you with them. Remember when you did that? Bang! Remember when you failed here? Boom! You're not an anointed man or woman of God. You're a grasshopper. That's what you are. And the, de the person goes, that's right, I am a grasshopper. I am an idiot. I am a failure. Oh, my God. I do suck. Are you getting this? This has nothing to do with God. They did this to themselves. They all saw exactly the same thing. All 12 of them. Same people, same Nephilim, same all of it. But perspective is in the mind of the beholder. Numbers 14, all the congregation lifted their voice. <laughs> Listen, it's bad enough you guys come to Moses and give him information he didn't ask you for. I didn't ask your opinion. Say, hello? God, God's word, when you look at it, God doesn't want your opinion on whether it's valid or not. He's not looking for you to cross-check it. He doesn't need to have it audited. Let's look at this and see if that's valid. God's not asking you to see if it's valid. See, he wants you to be like Mary and Mary. I am the handmaiden of the Lord. Zacharias. Oh. Nine months. What Angel Gabriel didn't know was when he got home, Elizabeth was... <laughs> She was totally in joy, you know. Come on, ladies. Can you imagine that? Your husband can't talk for nine months. You're, they're high-fiving it. Golly, I wish pregnancies were 15 months. Once you spread fear, it spreads to the sheep. They scatter quickly, Jesus said. Why? Sheep have anxiety disorders. They're not powerful, born-again men and women and sheep of God. They're all scared all the time. That's why they follow people. Oh.
mouth shut. Oh. <laughs> Sheep will do what they're told because they're scared. They got no guts. They got no backbone. All 12 of them saw the same thing. A different perspective brought a different report. Then they spread it. It sweeps through the camp, tent after tent after tent. Millions of Jews. Now they're scared. Whenever you say something negative, whenever you don't believe the word of God, the demons whip you with fear and it spreads through your family, through your church, through your work, through your ministry. Fear stops the anointing. Dead in its tracks. The whole congregation. Oh no. Everybody? You gotta be kidding me. When you became a born again Christian, you were supposed to get Egypt out of you. Did you know that? Most born again Christians still live with one foot in Egypt. They're trying to believe, but they got this thing dragging them down. Egypt, the Jews, still had Egypt in there. Oh, yeah, they became garlic and onions. Egypt, they were losers. Psychological again, ready? Who you really are manifests under pressure. You didn't hear me. You want to know what someone's really like? Uh -huh. Okay, what are they really like? Are they sitting there high, half asleep? No, that's not what they're really like. When you put pressure on somebody, the real person comes out. The Jews were still in Egypt. Well, that can be fixed real easy. God will just do a bunch of miracles. <laughs> miracles don't change people's hearts. They had seen every miracle in the book and still had Egypt in here. They saw miracles none of us will ever see till we get to glory. Red Sea, 10 plagues, unbelievable, shocking miracles, did them no good. Why? Fear whips miracles right out of your soul. What good do miracles do? Nothing. They're worthless. Well, that's, a, that's blasphemy. Really? Did you just read that? They had seen every miracle in the book. I wanted to go back to Egypt. Why? Their perspective was 2023. 20, and then, like Martha, they start pointing to the Lord. That's what born again Christians do. They get fussy. Their prayers don't get answered right away. Right away, they get fussy because the prayers weren't answered the way they thought it should be answered. So then they start going, "Hmm, you're at fault," which blocks the rest of the anointing and the rest of the prayers are all blocked now because you pointed your finger at the Lord. There they do. Why did the Lord do this to us? My God, our kids are going to die here. The Nephilim are over there. They're going to kill all of us. Oh, our wives are going to die. Oh, God, we should have stayed in Eva. Let's go back to Egypt. Let's find a guy to take us back. You believe that? Sure you do. It's God's word. They had seen every miracle in the book, the greatest miracles that have ever been seen since Noah, right back to Egypt. Why? Let this mind be in you, which was also... 
perspective. 2023, trash. 2024, boom. Let's switch to another one, shall we? You know the story. Everybody's read this a thousand times. You got the Palestinian, I mean the Philistines. That was a slip. <laughs> the Philistines over here. Can we delete that? <laughs> Kelly? The Philistines over here, Jews over here, Valley here, okay? And they're all eyeing each other, okay? Yeah, like a blind date. They're looking over there. They're looking over there. Everything looks fine. Now, I think we can do this. No problem. Saul is okay. King Saul, the psycho, he's fine. But then some guy pops out of the crowd over there. Goliath. He comes out. Weaponry and armor nobody had ever seen before. Couldn't believe it. Now, if you use 25 inches of the cubit, as I said, he was over 13 feet tall. And then the Bible describes his weaponry. It was like shocking, shocking. Okay. This, this guy made Wilt Chamberlain look small. And he was filthy, dirty, and demon-possessed, and vulgar, and nasty, vicious. He didn't want to kill you. He wanted to chop you up. He was a serial killer, a spree killer. He was John Wayne Gacy and Jeffrey Dahmer and Saddam Hussein, all wrapped up in the one guy. The devil was using him to whip the Jews. How was he doing that? Fear. Goliath was Satan's tool of spreading fear. When Saul and all Israel heard the words of the Philistine, Goliath, they were dismayed and what? Afraid. <laughs> Greatly afraid. Now, now we're talking about not just fear, but fear that paralyzes you. You can't move. Hello? Anybody had sleep paralysis? You're laying in bed at night, the demons come in. You can't move. You're trying to yell for Jesus and won't come up. That's greatly fear. Great fear. They're paralyzed with fear. They're dismayed. They don't know what to do. Dismayed. They were shocked. They couldn't, had no solutions. Well, King David, as you know, uh, his dad had given him, bunch, given him a bunch of vittles and some supplies to take to the battlefield. His dad was trying to help out with food and different things. And so uh, King David, the runt in the family, the last of the family, the, the guy that got no respect from anybody was given another dirty task. He was the dirty job guy. Okay? And you as a born again Christian just simply don't understand. You don't understand that you can't get where Mary wanted to go unless you're willing to do the dirty jobs first. I should have landed. You see, King David got the crap jobs. He gave him the worst job in the family. What was that? Watching sheep. Nobody wants to watch sheep. All they do is they go bah and poop. They're dumber in box of rocks. They're scared of everything. Nobody wants to watch sheep. He got stuck with it. Okay. But what you don't understand is, if you're at the crap end of the job, you are in Holy Ghost training. And God trains you when you're down at the bottom of the barrel, which is the best place to be. A bear comes up to grab some of these ignorant, stupid sheep. He wanted lamb chops or something. So King David says, hey, you're not taking any of my sheep, period. Then one day a lion comes up and says, hey, I'm hungry. No, you're not. Not with me around. 
God was using bears and lions, which doesn't seem spiritual at all, to turn him into the king of Israel. See, at your bottom is where you get the best training. When you're down at the bottom, that's when you listen better. Pastor, can I talk to you? Oh, I got my head in the clouds. I don't need to hear from you. Oh, he's a pastor. He's a moron. The person doing the grunt work is the one who listens. It's too deep for this section here. Something's wrong. David was in training in a rat hole. And because he had a perspective, he won. David, you go watch the sheep, and we'll all sit here in the tent and eat tamales. And you go out with the bears and the lions. And King David, instead of griping and pitching a fit over it, realized that he had a destiny to fulfill. And he says, I'll go watch the sheep, and I'll take the bears and lions. I'll go. Now, we want you to give you another rotten job. What's that? Take all these vittles to the front line to the troops and your brothers. Go help your brothers out. They're all ready to fight. He says, I'll do that job too. See, you can always tell Christians who are going somewhere because they'll do the dirty jobs. <laughs> yeah. See, it's the ego people that do the... I like to speak. Oh, I want to be on TV. Oh, I like to wear the suit. No, God's real servants are the ones scrubbing the floors. He takes the vittles, the cart. He takes it all the way. He takes it to the front line. He pops up there, and David's starting to, now he's really interested. He sees Goliath. He hears him cursing Israel. He hears him yelling at him. He's looking at his brothers. They're shaking their boots. He's looking at King Saul, the leader of Israel, called by God, shaking in his boots. This is not registering with David. It's not clicking. See, Christians that want to go to this level, they don't think like these Christians. They have a different... King David is not shaking in his boots. All the men of Israel were being beaten by Satan. With what? How does he get away with it? He puts negative thoughts in your head that are fearful thoughts. We're going to get killed. We're going to die out here. I'm going to lose my family. I, well, it runs on and on. They weren't just afraid, they were sore afraid. The men of Israel said, have you seen this guy? Unbelievable. What they're saying is the same as the spies. We're grasshoppers, see? Fear causes you to see yourself down here. Weak, useless, unprepared. That's why the devil uses it. He's a genius. You seen this guy? Oh. Carnal Christians are always motivated by what they see, what they hear. See. You remember Wigglesworth? He said, I'm not motivated by what I see and what I feel. I'm only motivated by what I believe. Wigglesworth was here, but he wanted to go here. See, he wanted to marry ministry, not Martha. Wigglesworth had a totally different perspective than the other church people. He didn't think like them. Listen, the king of Israel, Saul, he's trying to bribe everybody. <laughs> You'll be, you can marry his daughters. You can have several of them if you want. You, know. you get to take a trip. Or they're going to give you the yacht. 
You can get it on the internet and YouTube. Nobody took it. Why? When God offers you things, fear will keep you from stepping out and taking it. You're too scared. Oh, what if this doesn't work? What if they don't support me? What if the money doesn't come in? What if, what if, what if, what if? What ifs are fear-based questions. David said, what are you going to do about this situation? Now, when the lion came up, David knew what to do about it. Yeah. When the bear came up, he knew what to do about it. So now he's just simply asking a question of information. What are you guys going to do about this 13-foot Philistine? Assuming it was 25 inches. It may have been shorter. I don't know. I'm just, just using a general term. This guy's blaspheming us. He's ripping the whole nation of Israel. What? Who is this uncircumcised Philistine that he should defy the armies of the living God? David's perspective was here. Their perspective was grasshopper veil. Same situation, same people, same persons. Different perspectives. David said to Saul, listen, nobody's stepping up here. I remember the bear and the lion. I'll take this guy. What was the secret of his strength here? He saw himself not as a big shot and a superstar, but a servant. He says, the king Saul, who's already wet his pants, on the verge of pooping him, he says to him, I am your servant. See that? That's remarkable. No ego. Impressive. Saul said, you're not able to go against this guy. You're just a youth. He's been fighting since he was your age. He's a monster. And King David said, well, listen. You weren't out in the field with me when I was working in the trenches. People that have an anointing now, everybody just looks at them, but they don't understand what they had to go through to get that anointing. Hello? That should have landed huge. When somebody just sees you, they don't know what you've been through. They don't know the sorrow you've overcome. They don't know the challenges you had that you had to beat back. They don't understand any of it. All they see you is now. That's a mistake on their part, not yours. Listen, I got the bear, I got the lamb. I've already called on the name of Yahweh, Jehovah. I know, I know how to do that. I know how to pray. See, I'm like your grandma. She goes down to the altar. No fanfare, unassumingly. She's the only one at the altar with any power. Grandma. This guy's defying the armies of the living God. So did that bear. So did that lion. God trains you in the rat hole so you can be a superstar for him later. People who won't work in the la rat hole, people who won't clean his toilets, people won't, who won't work down here, they don't ever make it up there. They stay Martha. 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 That's where they stay. King, King Saul was panicking, but David's perspective was different. He saw this as an outrage. Wait a minute here. Jehovah, the Hebrew God, is listening to this giant slob. He heard what he said. That's an outrage. No, you don't understand. We're grasshoppers in our own sight. David said, the Lord delivered me. He's telling King Saul this, who's panicking. He's trying to, 
He's trying to encourage King Saul, and he, he sees himself as a servant. People who see themselves as big shots, they always stay at the bottom of the barrel because God can't trust them. He can't trust people who develop egos. He knows they won't submit. Sooner or later, they're going to go, well, I should have this. I should have that. I was cheated. Somebody screwed me. I ain't right. That's unjust. That's an injustice. I shouldn't have been raped. I shouldn't have been molested. That's an injustice. I shouldn't have been fired. That's outrageous. No, you know what a real injustice is? You sitting in there as a born-again Christian, you should be in hell right now, and you got mercy. That's the opposite of justice. You didn't get justice either. You got mercy. Since you got mercy, those people that screwed you over they can be forgiven. And that's the only way you're going to get from the bottom of the barrel to marry. I hope the ladies are listening. Saul said, you know what? We're all going to get killed anyway. It doesn't matter. So send him out there. He's just going to get killed, and then we're next. Why? Because I see myself as a grasshopper. You know, that's basically a sacrilege. If you got the Holy Ghost and see yourself as a grasshopper, that's a major problem. You got the Holy Ghost, the one and only? Are you kidding? You're a grasshopper with him? You must be nuts. You must have demons. You've got demons in your brain. That's what you've got. No, I'm not joking. You've got demons in your brain. They talked you into being a grasshopper, and you're, you've got the Holy Ghost, and you speak in tongues? You know what? You're sick in the head. And you let them in. King David said, hey, no. No, this is an outrage. I'll go out there. Then one of them walks up to him, David, listen. Buddy, probably his brother. David, listen, you can't go out there. He's got four brothers. That's not the only one. He's got four brothers. David goes, oh, thanks for the information. I need five stones. See, grasshoppers. Don't go get stones. They stay down here. And they spend the rest of their ministry down here. Five stones. I'll take this guy out. Then I'm going to get the other four. Why? King Saul? King David had a different perspective on life. Was David a trained soldier? Was he a better fighter than the other soldier? No, he was some kid watching shame. But your perspective takes you from here in Christ to here. Doesn't matter what you are. You can stay down here, 2023. That's your option. God will let you do it. You're a free will agent. Whatever you decide, he'll go ahead with it. I'm trying to get you to step up. Come on, ladies. I said, Mary. We got a lot of backsliders here, but tomorrow they're all going to get saved. <laughs> wow. Yes. This is what we call evangelism. 
What did he do next after he got the five stones looking for all five of them? They were all looking at one of them running for the hills. David went out looking for five. This is Holy Ghost power. What are you going to do, man? What are you going to do? It's your choice. It's not God's. Okay, it's not God's choice. Okay, don't, don't sit around going, I, I hope the Lord decides to use me. Stop it. That's unbelief. That's doubt. You're a liar. Just repent of it. Father's already got this thing ready for you. He needs somebody to step into it. Somebody's got to make a move. Twenty twenty four, you're going to be a killer this year. You know why? You're going to change your perspective. You're going to leave the grasshoppers behind. You're going to leave the sheep behind. You're going to go get five stones, not just one. You're going to win this thing, big. You want to watch sheep the rest of your life? Okay, well, if you do, nobody's going to criticize you. Martha had a good ministry. Somebody needs to watch a sheep. That's not, that's not something where you're a piece of crap if you're watching. A sheep is a real job. I'm not criticizing sheep, people, whatever they are. <laughs> but I'm saying, do you want to stay there, Martha? I say no. I say no. I say you want to go up here. You want to go into the holy of You want to. That's what you want. Okay. Didn't know I was a prophetic there, did you? Yeah. Want me to start spouting prophecies for you? Donald Trump's going to win the election. <laughs> yeah, how you like that one? Yeah. Want another prophecy? Stupid. I'm not talking about those fake prophets. I'm talking about God's word. I'm telling you, you go get five stones. Well, I don't have this and I don't have that. Perfect. You're down in the bottom. You're learning down there. You're being trained down there. God's going to bring you up here. You can't lose. Twenty twenty three is gone. You know, don't send me any emails, but to hell with it. Twenty twenty four, you win. You left your grasshopper behind. You are no longer a grasshopper in your own eyes. Who is this uncircumcised idiot turning my son into a drug addict, turning my daughter into a whore, stealing our finances, sending me into foreclosure, bankrupting us? Who is this uncircumcised demon ripping our family apart? I'm going to go get five stones. Father's waiting for you to do it. He's sitting there waiting for you to do it. You want all those things fixed and more? You make your move in 2024. Yeah, I watch TV preachers. I know how to rhyme. Yeah. I see the jealousy on your face. Yeah, total envy. No, I'm serious. I'm serious. Your perspective determines the rest of your life and how you die. 